Major warning this summer, there's a risk of blackouts for anyone who lives from the West Coast to the Great Lakes. Record heat, drought, and power plant closures are some of the factors putting a strain on the power supply. I think it could very quickly become the new normal if we don't um, begin to rethink how we design, construct, and operate uh, the electricity system. You know, we know that the impacts of climate change, higher temperatures, more intense heat waves, um, wildfires, floods, droughts, all those things affect the electricity system. They make it harder to produce and deliver electricity. Blackouts won't just be a Texas problem this summer. As temperatures rise around the globe, power grids are already struggling to keep up with demand. I'm Yasmin Khan with Rebel HQ, and in previous videos, we've talked about the polar vortex that hit Texas last year, causing the state's power grid to fail and knocking out power to homes across the state. This all led to homes being destroyed by ice and burst pipes, and it either directly or indirectly led to the death of at least 246 Texans. Now the summer months might prove just as strenuous for the power grids, the Eastern, the Western, and the Texan, and we're already seeing blackouts and brownouts in places like New York City. New York has some pretty hot summers, but they're definitely not the South. Now real quick, what is the difference between a blackout and a brownout? A blackout is a complete failure of the electric system, whereas a brownout is a partial failure. The brownouts are either intentional or unintentional, and in the case of intentional brownouts, power companies can choose to restrict or basically ration electricity in anticipation of high usage. So for instance, if there's a heat wave coming and people are expected to jack up their air conditioners to cope with it, the power companies can say, okay, you can have a little, but don't go too crazy. We have to make sure that there's enough to go around. Now, recent reports Reporting from the New York Times cited research showing that average temperatures in the United States are in fact rising. There's no denying it, it's not a matter of perspective, it's historical data. And it's not just here. France and California are struggling with their wine industries because their climates are now too warm for the grapes. Those industries are now moving north to the UK and Washington state. Similarly, India's mangoes are literally shriveling on the trees from the extreme heat that they're experiencing over there. So in the short term, the number one thing to do is start um, factoring climate change into electric system planning. So think about how different climate impacts will affect different parts of the of the system and where we need to make those investments to upgrade facilities. Um, longer term, we need to be thinking about our energy mix, thinking about um, building in additional sort of redundancies into the system um, so that it does operate more reliably and can continue to um, provide electricity in these extreme events. So many parts of this planet have been made habitable by modern technologies. Where I live in Houston, it's practically a swamp that we just paved over. There's a neighborhood on the north side of Houston that came into being specifically because the people wanted a break from the heat and the mosquitoes closer to the coast where I am. Today, that's one of Houston's most popular neighborhoods. But we've already hit the triple digits here and it's barely June and our hottest month is usually August, so who knows what we'll be dealing with by then. Those triple digit days have been getting more and more common over the past few years, but at least in Houston, our society is built around the fact that it's too hot for people to live naturally. We drive everywhere because our public transportation is nearly non-existent, so most people just go from their air-conditioned homes to their air-conditioned cars to their air-conditioned destinations, the grocery store, the office, whatever. Beyond that, people don't really go outside during the hottest hours of the day if they can avoid doing so. It's too hot to live here otherwise, and without some kind of heat management, it can be dangerous to do so in these extreme temperatures. Now, of course, we knew that our planet was getting to this point and we did nothing to prevent it from happening. Now we're living with the consequences. Now we're seeing the most vulnerable communities bearing the brunt of the burden, even though those same communities tend to contribute to the problem the least. Following the Texas polar vortex and a 2019 heat wave in California, researchers have identified some unfortunate patterns. In both cases, the power outages were more deeply felt in lower income neighborhoods, while the higher income neighborhoods were significantly less affected. Now, the capitalistic explanation for this is that the power companies make more money from higher income neighborhoods, so their power usage is prioritized. They figure they'll lose less money by throttling power to already low usage households. Also, power is usually prioritized for hospitals, fire departments, etc., so people living near those areas tend to do better during intentional brownouts. 
Another consideration is that affluent people have more options during times of crisis. For example, people with more disposable income might have been able to invest in solar panels, battery operated systems, backup generators, etc. They also would have the resources to just pack up and go to a hotel or another town during a time of crisis and just wait it all out. Conversely, the structural disparities that these neighborhoods face when compared against one another only become further exacerbated during times of crisis. For instance, during the polar vortex, many homes flooded when their pipes froze over and burst. That's a whole other set of problems that those people had to deal with, many of whom are still dealing with those same problems. That was on top of already these same areas getting hit particularly hard by the pandemic. As our planet changes and resources like water, vegetables, and power become more and more scarce, the people who can afford to pay for things will be fine. They might not even notice what's going on in these other communities. You know, people tend to see the world that's immediately around them and extrapolate what they see as a fact of the greater world. It's very hard to step into someone's shoes and see the world from their perspective because we don't actually know enough about their perspectives to do so, especially as we self-isolate ourselves within our own communities. For the elites, I would argue that they don't even realize how isolated they are from the rest of the world, nor would I expect them to be aware of the ignorance that sort of isolationism tends to breed. And I'm not faulting them for it either, it happens, and it takes a lot of an individual effort to overcome. But the fact of the matter is that we have a problem that will only get worse before it even thinks about getting better, and we have empirical data to support the things that we can already feel and see for ourselves. The people who have been elected to govern the rest of us should be a little bit more aware of the communities they're responsible for, more than the average citizen and more than the elite citizen. They asked us for that responsibility and we let them have it. Climate change is a platform that we should all be voting on. Politicians who do nothing about it, or worse, politicians who downplay its effects, are little more than threats to our existence as a global society.